Welcome to the Millennial Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Clay Fink. And today I bring Chris Franco onto the show. Chris, welcome to the show. Clay, thanks so much for having me. You know, I've really enjoyed looking through all your content lately. We had a really good chat pre-show, so I know this is going to be a really good conversation. And, you know, I was looking through all the content you put out. It's very clear you're a huge fan of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. I'd like to start out by just asking you what led you to being so passionate about, you know, their overall investment philosophies, as well as eventually creating content related to the message they're putting out. For sure. Um, I think it started for me with Charlie Munger. Um, but I think if, if I had to trace everything back, it was actually for reasons that weren't investing related. Um, like I'm sure a lot of people who listen to your podcast, I had found myself or found myself reading uh, Farnham Street uh, many years ago, let's say around, I want to say 2014, 2015, but you know, give or take. And Charlie Munger was a prominent, uh, prominent name on that site. And I found that as around the time I was very immersed working, um, you know, for a startup and I was about to be starting my own business. And, you know, I was always looking for a sort of a, just wisdom about how to, how to do things in a way that I didn't know just by being a, someone who was in my mid to late twenties at the time. And Charlie Munger, everything that he talked about doing, and it wasn't like there was tons of content about him at that time either, but if I applied those ideas, they really worked for me. And I think, you know, there's so many people offering quote unquote self-help type of content online. And I just found the, the, just the simplicity and the rationality behind the thinking and then the utility of what he was saying to be so helpful that it really gave his brand a lot of credibility to me. And as I was, you know, kind of in a parallel or simultaneously getting more and more involved in my own investing, um, it was only natural that I became curious about, well, what does Charlie Munger do and how did he influence someone who, you know, even a casual observer would say is you know, the greatest investor of all time, Warren Buffett. Uh, what, what exactly, what role did he play? And then I found myself, it was, I remember vividly, it was um, 2015. I was in Los Angeles for seeing some family, but also for uh, some business. And I I think I had the 2015 Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting transcript um, of the Q&A. And maybe it was for the previous year. The year doesn't matter as much as much as what I took from it. And I'm reading through this and it's, again, just Charlie and Warren going back and forth. And I was struck by how, um, how humble they were. They were, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking these guys are both, I say these guys, I, I don't want to sound like I, you know, on that friendly level with them, but just that's what my brain was telling me. Like these guys, these guys are billionaires and they're talking about themselves. Like they're a bunch of dogs, you know, like we were so stupid to do this and wow, we really, you know, we really blew it on this deal. And that was such a stark contrast to so much of the quote unquote, like billionaire wisdom that was online at the time. And I know from at the time, I was also studying a lot of psychology and getting more into that of that world as well. And realizing what they were doing took it to a different level because it's so hard for us to acknowledge our own mistakes. So the fact that they were doing that showed me the, the kind of like real intellectual superiority that they were they were demonstrating by being so humble. Because um, at that point, you know, to be so successful and still and still really talk down on your past mistakes uh, not only is that hard to do, but it's also really effective um, in, in terms of making yourself better. So I was just very impressed by the overall, um, it, just everything they were doing. And as I got more into the investment philosophy, I would say, you know, when I first got into it, I, I had the overconfidence bug where I thought I understood it. And I figured, oh, this is, I got it now. And I remember, I don't remember the exact year, but it wasn't long after I, I loaded up on, I think, Bank of America stock, because I was, again, learning by my own mistakes here, thinking, oh, yeah, this is what you do. Like they, Berkshire owns. Bank of America, they know stuff. I, I should buy Bank of America and I'll load up on it because, you know, that's what you do. You just got to, you know, concentrate your bets. And, you know, Bank of America had like a, a rough day. And I think I was, I was ready. I was back on fidelity.com hitting the sell button because um, I you know, didn't have the stomach. I, it was very humbling. But, um, you know, that as I got deeper and deeper into the weeds of investing and trying to find my own approach, and I'd say it's one that involves plenty of uh, John Bogle as well, um, I began to really appreciate. Um, just how everything, you don't have to follow everything they do as an investor. And I don't think any one investor has a style that someone should adopt just completely. I think you have to find what, what really what works best for you um, and make sure that it does make sense to you, not just because someone else does it, but the approach that Warren Buffett and, and Charlie Munger, let's say kind of their hybrid approach, um, it really agrees with reality. And I think there's a lot of different philosophies that are that are shared and you hear them every day on TV, online. They sound really good and they seem even intuitive. Um, but when I look at, you know, the approach that Charlie and Warren have have used over the years and have continued to adapt or change, 
it, like I said, agrees with reality. And what I mean by that is that if you take these big ideas that really are proven, you know, people always use the word mental models. I just prefer models, you know, being these, these big, big concepts you'd find in like the 101 of any textbook for any subject, you know, agreed upon ideas um, that are, again, have been, have been tested against reality and, and up to our current level of knowledge work out. Um, you know, they're like the example of concentrating your bets, you know, if that makes sense, you know, that, that is a better approach than diversification if you know what you're doing. And, and again, not everyone has to, should do that in most cases, but um, you know, the idea of your circle of competence, like that aligns with the ideas around probabilities and probabilistic thinking. You know, I, I used an analogy once talking to my audience about, um, you know, when you're, you're taught that test taking, uh, was it a test taking tactic where you eliminate what you know is not true. So if I'm looking at a sea of investment opportunities and I know, look, I know nothing about materials companies. And you, I take, I can say that because I'm like, look, can I figure it out? Sure. But right now, do I have any edge over anyone else? Absolutely not. I would get clobbered trying to play that game. So let me just not even look at those companies right now and narrow it down. And that idea is just so useful. Man, so many good lessons there. You know, I think a lot of people that fall into the Warren and Charlie uh, camp and school of thought, they'll go down the investment route. They'll discover Warren, discover Charlie and learn about their investment philosophies. And then they go to a Berkshire meeting and then they end up falling into this, you know, philosophical way of looking at life. And you kind of came at it the opposite direction is the way it sounded. You know, you came through this philosophy side and then you fell down the investment rabbit hole. So I find that pretty funny. And then you also mentioned mental models and I, you know, have thought about a lot about this lately, how, how powerful they can be. Just, you know, one way I think this is just so powerful is it just gives you, you know, fr a framework to operate from. It's, you know, so many people just go off of their emotions or grow off of, you know, whatever they read off that day and they have no kind of framework to base their decisions off of. And I think just the having that framework can be so powerful and give you, you know, just a framework to just operate and invest. 100%. Um, you know, one of the things that helps me when people always ask, you know, what is it? Because I think the mental model concept can somehow be morphed into like coming up with like almost memorizing different concepts and, and using it that way. I find it to be more on the holistic level, just you're trying to distinguish between reality and, and delusion. And so we know that as, you know, as human beings, what we perceive is our reality, but we know that our perception is flawed. And so these mental models can help sharpen your, your perception. And again, see if helps you check out and actually make sure that what you're seeing and, and believing is uh, is true, or at least as close to truth as we know it to be. Um, and I think that's incredibly useful in investing. But as I know, Charlie Munger has talked about, you know, since his his first kind of introduction of the topic back in the, uh, the early to mid nineties, it's incredibly useful for life in general, because there's all sorts of scenarios where that same type of thinking is very useful, not just in investing, but just in life period. I'm always interested in chatting with stock investors and getting their opinion on, you know, whether they like picking stocks or they just stick with index funds. You mentioned John Bogle earlier, and we recently had an episode where we brought on Eric Balchunas to chat about his new book that was all about uh, John Bogle. And, you know, John Bogle would say, you know, you should invest 100% of your money in index funds. And one of your videos, you have applied that to your own portfolio, but you put that number as a minimum of 60% of your portfolio should be in index funds. And then the rest are in individual stocks following, you know, the school of thought of how Warren and Charlie invest because, you know, you recognize the power of index fund investing, but you know, you also kind of scratch that itch on investing in ind individual stocks. So I, I'm curious to hear your thought process on why you chose this approach. Sure. Um, you know, and I think now I've, I've even said it should be even higher than 60. And again, just for myself, and, uh, and it's almost a hedge against myself, right? And coming out of a bull market, you know, you, it's very easy to start to feel like you're Warren Buffett himself. Um, but realizing that, you know, I'm always trying to, one of my biggest takeaways is, you know, overconfidence is a killer for us as investors. So I'm constantly trying to make sure I'm, you know, having those, that humility um, that I think is required to succeed long term. As far as indexing and why I think it, it just makes sense, it's really coming from just a data perspective. Um, of course, John Bogle, I often refer to him as Jack Bogle. Um, he makes such a bulletproof argument for the the reasons or the the benefits of indexing. And, it, you know, I think he's almost to the point where his books are 
they're not the most enjoyable reads. Not because I recommend them a lot of times, but he's just drilling that point home. You, it's like, okay, I get it. Like I can't argue back on this. Um, but I know there's also other papers that I've, I've read over the years to it sharpen my own investing IQ. Uh, some by the SEC, some about, and I've taken a Charlie Munger approach here. So it's funny because a Charlie Munger's approach has led me to be even more bullish on indexing. Whereas Charlie Munger says, you know, it's, we know what he said about indexing. I don't need to repeat it. Um, but, you know, what are all the mistakes that investors tend to make? And I want to make sure I avoid those mistakes. And almost always on the list is we're bad at picking stocks. Um, you know, they found there's a lot of behavioral studies that find that the more often we are buying and selling, the worse we tend to do long term. You know, that's been validated by um, a study that was commissioned by uh, by the Congress and the SEC um, and, no, and tons of other studies. So I don't want to turn this into like an academic decathlon, but um, but it very much my approach has been informed by that. And then that um, those studies have agreed with my reality and my experiences and the challenges of picking stocks. I mean, one epiphany that I had probably in around 2019 was that, you know, it's not that for me anyway, it's not that enjoyable picking stocks because I do, even though I know I shouldn't look at it all the time, I still do look at it all the time. You know, the investments I've made in low cost index funds have been, it's been the easiest way to make money. I might've made a little bit less than had I, you know, picked Apple in 2015 or something like that, but I have, I've never doubted it. I've never, I don't get uncomfortable about it. I understand it. And it's to me, allows me to have more time to do where focus on the things where I can actually be like the Warren Buffett of, and that's not going to be picking stocks. I, I I don't fool myself that I'm, uh, you know, down the street from me is wall street. You know, there's men and women down there who are extremely smart. A lot of people I know who are working at this six days a week, nonstop, yeah, hugely incentivized to find all the edge they can find. And, um, you know, that's your competition. So it's just being realistic too about, you know, who I'm competing against. And if I have the, the time, energy and, and effort, uh, required to go and do that. And it's just not realistic if you're doing something else in your life. I mean, you need to be like Warren and, and Charlie to a certain degree, you need to be fully focused on that. Um, and I think most of us who are passionate about investing are doing other things, um, you know, unless you're doing it full time. So that's, my, that's kind of what led me, I think, in that direction. You know, when looking through your work and just the, the strict principles you put on, you know, what makes a quality investment, I can't help but wonder given, you know, how far you narrow down your stock select selection process, why is it still so difficult to beat the market, even though, you know, you're, you're buying quality companies and you're, you have all these other um, principles in place to ensure that you aren't going to mess this up. Why is it still so difficult to beat the market? I think it's psychology. I think psychology is the number one reason. And we are, you know, we know we can't be hundred percent rational, you know, as much as there's been times you know, I've gone against and That's why I love making content is because it's this great feedback loop. And to see, you know, if you're actually doing the things you're talking about, um, I like to think in most cases I do, but there's been times I know with an Alibaba investment where, you know, I realized I overdid it. I was overly excited about it because everything was so expensive. I e-commerce is in my, it's my circle of competency. You know, it, it checks all the, all the boxes. I went through the whole process and then watching an old YouTube video where I said, I literally said, I don't need this risk. And I was like, why is this, why am I breaking all my rules in terms of how much of my portfolio this was? And I had to, I had to eat that humble pie and say, you know what? You overdid it. And again, it was psychology. Um, I think that's what gets us every time. And in terms of beating the market, I think you can, beating the market in the short term is a lot more possible. I think when we get into these long time horizons, which I think that's my biggest, you know, that's why I call CMQ is compound money quietly. I think that's the for the individual, that's what we need to remember is what we're trying to do is, is make our money compound over a long period of time. That's how, regardless of where you're starting from, that's how wealth is really built. There's, it's a, a reliable way to build wealth. And, um, you know, when you interrupt that process by having to, to sell, even when you're selling to take a short-term gain, um, the taxes that you're incurring at that moment, those are all things that are interrupting the process in, in one way or another. And I think it all comes down to the psych, the psychology of it. So, I think people can pick stocks and have the intellectual capacity to do that. I think that was something I was um, pleasantly surprised by as I dove into this space very much a, a you know, kind of a blank, a blank canvas um, is that, you know, and there's other investors that mentioned that you don't need to know any high math really to, you know, to, to value a business. It doesn't mean you'll do it right, but the, you can teach yourself some of these things if you have the basic, you know, one-on-ones of math and things like that. Um, but when it comes down to actually sticking to something and holding it through thick and thin, through ups and downs, through a bear market like right now, where you know the market is very different than it was, you know, two years ago, um, I think that's what what gets us off our game. 
Um, and that would be, that's my take anyway. The other, I could go technical here and say, well, if you also are working with maybe a, uh, an advisor and you're paying fees and things like that, or, you know, high expense ratios or commissions and things like that, that can also contribute to you not beating the market. But, um, I think the psychology is number one for me. I was talking about the strict framework you've put around investing in individual stocks. And I'd like for you to walk through your checklist or criteria to determine what makes a company investable for you. I just found this really interesting. Yeah. So the one, the way I came up with it was helpful for me was I went through every Berkshire meeting, um, going back to, since they've been transcribing them, which is in the 1994, there's Berkshire means before that, but they're, I think the only transcripts available are, are, kind of loose transcripts from that book. Um, I Forgive me if I get this wrong. The uh, University of Berkshire Hathaway. I'm not sure if you've read that. I really enjoyed that book. But um, going through and going, and I put them all into a Google sheet and I, I basically could use it like a, you know, uh, what is it? Search and find anything I wanted to find. Like what is everything Charlie Munger has said about this topic? And doing that, I was able to look up everything that uh, both Charlie or Warren have said about what makes a good business good or a bad business bad. And I put that into a sheet and I started with the good things. And then I did the inversion exercise where I was like, okay, what's the opposite of having, you know, a strong business model? Well, it'd be a, a really bad business model, right? Like as, as simple as that. And from there, I came up with 18 different characteristics uh, that would be of a bad business or what makes a bad business bad. And for me using that, it, it's been, again, it's, it doesn't sound that when I say it out loud, I feel like I didn't come across any sort of like, you know, epiphany, but it did feel like an epiphany. Um, and it's been really useful. I'm, I'm trying to think some of the examples. I mean, when you have a capital intensive business, uh, a business that we said has a bad business model, has customers that are not loyal, you know, has a lot of churn. I could go down the list like that. And it's not meant to be, oh, if you do this, you'll be a successful investor. But I think with all these, these tools we come up with, it, it allows us to just have something that's more reliable. It'll, it's a more reliable um, way to go about it. Um, it doesn't guarantee you're going to become, you know, the next Warren Buffett or the next stock ma stock market billionaire. Um, but I think you can avoid making a lot of the mistakes that are very easy to make, even for experienced investors, because um, it's hard not to have some sort of. If you're researching a company long enough, it, I would imagine in a way it's like if you've seen the movie uh, "The Catch Me If You Can" with uh, Tom Hanks, Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh -uh. Well, if anyone's out there seen it, you, you would develop some affinity for your subject. And he's chasing Leonardo DiCaprio's character. This guy's a, you know, he's a con artist, um, but he has Tom Hanks character has some affection for him over time because you see, you can see the good and the bad. And I think it's only natural for us to, you know, it's mere exposure effect. I could go down that list as well and say, why do we sort of fall in love with some of these companies? Uh, you see it now all the time. I mean, I found myself doing that with Alibaba to an extent and I cut myself off. But when you have these, these filters, you can say, oh, wait a minute. I know I love this company, but yeah, the, the customer churns really bad. And that's in all likelihood not going to make for a great investment situation for me. I did look through your list of what makes a bad business. And one of those items on the checklist was actually the business is maturing. And that kind of mm. caught me by surprise. Why do you think this is an attribute of a bad business? I would say, you know, and it's funny because bad is such a like kind of a simpleton word. Probably for more of like, a, there's not a lot of high growth left. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not sure what would be maturing. If I was looking, one of my favorite businesses that I still learn new things about, and I, again, it's so obvious, but Apple, um, I was just recently getting into all of, I wanted to learn more about Tim Cook and what he brought to the table as it was the supply chain. And I thought I knew a lot about that, but with a little more research, I learned so much more to where I'm always like, there's more to learn here. You know, if someone could say, oh, Apple's business is maturing. You could potentially come to that conclusion. I wouldn't come to that conclusion because for me, it's about, are they still coming out with a, an innovative product that's a hit? Let's say at least they've had one within the last five years. When that stops happening, then I would say, okay, they might be maturing. But, you know, then they surprised everyone with the AirPods. And that was such an awesome product. Or in my opinion, it was. I don't mean to be like an Apple commercial here. Apple is not sponsoring this podcast, just for the record. Um, but you know, I think that's definitely thinking more in terms of what will be a, uh, an investment that could outpace the market would be a company that has, you know, has that, that room to grow. Um, so, and I, and I think it also, it comes back to something that Charlie or Warren had said, I'm not sure who, who made the point, but, um, you know, I think it reminds me of what Peter Lynch had said about sometimes he referred to it like innings in a baseball game, you know, what inning is this business in? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think a lot of investors like Facebook is a business that I look at is they, Hey, they could figure it out with the metaverse. But right now, their ad business, the best days of their ad business are, unless something dramatically changes, they're behind them. But I see, 
And again, smart people. I see smart people on my Twitter feed who are talk- talking about Facebook's business like it's the the ne- they, they just discovered gold. Uh, and I don't even invest in gold, by the way. I just want to be clear. I would, <laughs> would I make that reference. Um, but the, you know, I would say, well, their business has matured for sure. And so your expectations about how it's done in the past are should not not impact what you think the future holds. I, I want to say this is a Warren Buffett quote. It's not an exact quote here, um, but he talks about you could find a great horse that had you know an amazing 14 years, but you don't realize it's headed to the glue factory. Um, and I think that goes back to this idea of what does that mean? Why a, a maturing business could be potentially be a bad one. Mm-hmm. Man, that's really interesting. It kind of reminds me of a, one of your um, videos you put together. It talked about the difference in how Warren Buffett perceives risk versus Mm. how the academics perceive risk. And it's just two totally different definitions. Could you walk us through, um, you know, how Warren Buffett views risk other than different than academics? Sure. Um, And I have to give a little personal context here because I think this is for me, I get really interested in things. I have, I get obsessed with them and I like to say a healthy way. Um, but you know, my, my immersion in this world has been one of that's been driven by my own interest and passion in it. And one of the reasons Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger have, have helped me with that is because I, I was pleasantly surprised to find that they also thought in a similar way that I do not about, obviously they're way beyond me, but, um, in looking at things and everyone says it's one thing and you say it's the opposite and you're sure that it's right. Um, many times in my life I've gone my own path and it's worked better for me, but yet in kind of conventional academia, you're told, no, 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 do it this way. Um, And if you ever want, I can give a personal story later, but going back into what Warren Buffett would say risk is, risk is is all about, um, it's all about permanent loss of capital. You know, the risk is you lose your money. Whereas in academia, it's taught as risk is equals volatility. Um, So a lot of the strategies that, you know, you might be recommended by an advisor or someone like that are oftentimes to minimize the volatility you'll feel. Um, In more traditional times, there might be a better allocation between stocks and bonds because when stocks are just, you know, you can't, stocks are bad, uh, bonds lessen the blow than if you're, you know, 100% in, let's say the VU. Um, you know, you might, you'd be down um, again, hypothetically here, but let's say if the VU is down 20% this year, you know, you're down 10%. And so, you know, that makes people feel a little bit better. Um, you know, when you're in a business that I think rewards that year to year retention and someone says, Hey, well, my buddies did this and they're not thinking long-term because it's hard for our brains to think like that. Well, that would make sense. That definition would kind of, would, would be the definition of the day. Uh, but what Warren Buffett said, and I love this example, he said, you know, if you buy Coca-Cola today, and you have to sell it in three weeks, that's a very risky investment. You know, who knows where the price of Coke will be because Mr. Market is dictating that, not the fundamentals of the business. But if you buy Coke and you have to sell it in 10 years, well, that's a much less risky, uh, that's a much less risky proposition or an investment. And that to me, it just, it just went off like a light bulb. And because there's things sometimes where I've, I had an intuition about something, but I didn't have the language for it or the, or the guidance as to what am I sensing here? Because I never totally understood that idea of why I'd want to have a portfolio that would be, that would do less well over a long period of time. I just, no one ever put it in a way that was so simple and pragmatic. Um, And it just, like I said, just resonated. And what I'm surprised by, but then not surprised by, because this, this is not something that's just in finance. It's very difficult for the, the old the definitions of the day to go away. And I think, again, going back to Warren and Charlie here, they've talked about it usually, usually takes like a generation for the, the generation to die out, you know, because those old ideas have to literally, you need someone who's totally unpersuaded by them to say, yeah, yeah, that's the way we used to think the world was. It's actually this way. I don't know if that'll be the case here, but um, I know that in general, uh, you know, volatility makes people uncomfortable, but it's not, I would not categorize it as a risk. Um, only It's only a risk if you need the money. It's interesting to think through uh, that idea of maturity I brought up. You know, you mentioned Alibaba earlier. You mentioned Coca-Cola. It's like, okay, is Coca-Cola a growing business or is it more of a mature business? And I'm going to dig into some of your other portfolio holdings. But when I look at them, you know, a lot of them are really large companies. You look at Mm. Apple or Microsoft or Costco all these are really large companies. So it's really interesting to sort of think about, you know, where, what inning it's in and how mature some of these businesses actually are. Hey guys, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Trade Coffee for supporting the Investors Podcast Network. I've always had trouble finding fresh coffee at the grocery store because a lot of the time it has been sitting on the shelves for weeks and eventually goes stale. 
Trade Coffee sells the freshest roasted and ethically sourced beans from America's best local roasters. They deliver right to your doorstep with free shipping as often as you'd like. I got started with Trade by taking their simple quiz online. It was super easy as they asked me a few questions such as how I make my coffee, whether I'm a coffee expert or beginner, and if I add milk or cream to my coffee. The results matched me with the Nebula Dark Roast. And let me tell you guys, I cannot get enough of it. It was roasted right here in the U.S. in Oakland, California, and it has a comforting and rich taste with added honey to help me satisfy my sweet tooth. Another reason I love Trade is because they support small businesses and ensure they're sourcing their beans from sustainable sources. Trade has delivered over 5 million bags of fresh coffee, and they have more than 750,000 positive reviews. If that isn't enough for you, Trade literally guarantees you'll love your first bag too, or they'll replace it for free. Right now, Trade is offering new subscribers a total of $30 off your first order plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash TIP or click the link in the description below. That's more than 40 cups of coffee for free. Get started by taking their quiz at drinktrade.com slash TIP and let trade find you a coffee you'll love. That's drinktrade.com slash TIP for $30 off your first order. 100%. I think, you know, large cap companies probably are have a higher likelihood of being maturing just by nature of the fact that they're large cap and, you know, how much, you know, what's the, uh, what's the likelihood that they continue growing at the same rate? You know, I think if we look just from a standpoint of like, what's the base rate there? Uh, how many companies can continue that growth trajectory? Um, I'm not sure about Coca-Cola. I mentioned what I thought about Apple. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know if you want me to talk about some of the other uh, holdings in there, but I think some of the smaller caps that I do have that I have almost more of like a, an interest, they don't even make the percentage of the portfolio because they're so small relative. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I do enjoy looking at smaller or even, you know, mid-sized companies because it helps me better understand what's going on in the world around me in a way that that's why I love 10 K so much. Um, 10 Ks for me, I think more people should read them, not just because they need to invest in the business, but because it's literally just the truth about what's going on with a given company or industry. Um, I know as an entrepreneur, uh, during COVID, I read all of the 10 Ks for all similar companies to mine. And it really helped me see the competitive landscape in a way that I wouldn't have seen it before. And it was just merging the two worlds. You know, I was not unaware of my competitors, but you know, they, they, there's a section about their strategy. There's a section about the risks and you don't have to agree or, or mimic whatever they're, they're saying, but it definitely um, helps you see yourself within the context of the bigger picture. Um, and I think that's really useful as well as I think for, I think in general, you know, small businesses are such a huge, a huge uh, a force in the United States, right? Small businesses are really, you know, someone could say the lifeline or the lifeblood of our economy. Um, you know, I know I have a small business. I'm, you know, one of those people. So maybe I'm biased by saying that. Um, but I think, you know, more people, there's a huge passion and interest in entrepreneurship. You see that on social media. I'm sure you see that, Clay, and the different accounts that, you know, follow you or you follow and, uh, or even that are just suggested to us. People are looking for different ways to kind of take control of their finances or their financial futures. And, you know, investing is certainly one way to do that. But when you look at, I look at the, one of the truths of investing for me is it's all about businesses and probably my best investment where I I'm riskiest is with my own business, right? I'm putting up my own capital every year, you know, to get a return on that capital. And more people, when I think when you read something like a 10 K, it gets you thinking more about businesses and any human being, in my opinion, if you, if, you know, if you're listening to this or, you know, this is something you're interested in, not everyone has to start a business or needs to, or it's not a requirement, but anyone's capable of it. And I think having more examples of it's like you, what you put in front of you kind of you know dictates what directions you go in and sort of like, you know, the quality of the friends you talk to the most. If you're thinking about businesses a lot, it's very difficult to walk around doing your day-to-day routines and not be like, hmm, I wonder if anyone's, you know, made a company that does this because it seems like there's a void for that. So yeah, I think it's just uh, 10Ks are a great discovery mechanism for that. One company I would love to dive into specifically is Costco. Yes. You know, it's, it's a business that, obviously is high quality. You know, it falls under the bucket where, you know, it's simple to understand. You can see how the business operates and how it's a win-win for all parties, the customers, for Costco, for shareholders, for the suppliers. Everyone's getting a good deal. You can see the flywheel effect happening with Costco. And, you know, definitely Charlie Munger himself is even a big, uh, he's been invested in Costco for many years from what I'm aware and mm-hmm. 
definitely falls in line with the quality company, strong moat, strong competitive advantages. You go down the line. So as a retail store, you know, it's definitely a competitive space. I'm curious to get your thoughts on, you know, what makes Costco's business just so strong and so uh, durable? Well, first and foremost, I would say to anyone who, if you don't read 10Ks and you want to start somewhere, read Costco's. Because I think it's one of those, especially when you compare it to other businesses you'll come across, you'll see the, it's just, it's a no brainer in terms of what the business model is. And it's, it seems so obvious when you read it, but then you say, wow, that someone like thought this out and built around it. And this idea that we're going to, you know, we're going to one, make everything work more efficiently. We're going to have less hands touching the inventory. We're going to set up our stores in a way that it doesn't require us to stock the shelves. Uh, we can, we can have, we're, we're only going to order, you know, the like one color Gatorade that's the most popular. Uh, I could go, I mean, it's, I don't want to get too in the, the weeds here yet, but on Costco side, I think what you said about win-win is so important. I think any business, and it seems like it's an overly simplified way to look at things, but if you use this model, I think you'll find a lot of businesses that succeed really do follow it. And that is where every every stakeholder in that business is benefiting. Um, I think first and foremost, the customers. You know, when I think about Costco, is they're just 1000 percent dedicated to giving customers the lowest prices on things that they use and need on a regular basis. And and it's not just talk, it's not a good, you know, PowerPoint presentation. If you look at their margins and you ask, well, why don't they have a bigger profit margin? It's because they're passing it on to the customer. Um, right now, gas at Costco, I just uh, did a little conversation about this. Um, I believe c- people are saving like, and don't hold me to this because I'm sure the times will change, but something like 37 cents a gallon when you go to Costco to get your gas. Costco does this thing where they refuse to raise the price of their hot dogs. And it sounds like such almost like a little a thing, but it's their commitment to a just low price. The second thing is Costco takes really good care of their employees. Um, and I've talked to people because I get really into stuff. I've talked to people who work there who, and who have worked there on all levels. And it's not just, again, not just talk. Every business you look into is going to say, we care about our, we care about our people. And, you know, it's all about career, start your career with us. Costco's dead serious about it. And people will start there and they'll start there at the lowest level and stay there for a long, they're getting paid better than they would anywhere else. And they get to stay there for a long time and they have a, a, a actual career trajectory. Um, that also wears off in a good way onto the customer. Cause when you're dealing with people that are happy to be at their jobs that come, it's, I mean, walk into an Apple store and compare that to the days when you'd walk into like a Best Buy and, you know, you return something to the Apple store, they make you feel smart. You know, you go and talk to a genius, uh, who's happy to help you versus being like, well, did you take it out first? You know, it's a totally different vibe and that does matter. Um, other thing with Costco, I think if we think about just some of the the things that are not as as um as easy to copy. Um, there's been competitors that have come along to try to do what they do. Um, I know Walmart made Sam's Club. I'm not sure when they made it. If it was in a direct response, I don't want to give false history here. But you know, I would be concerned if Costco was maybe brand new and then everyone's going to rush to make their their equivalent version of that. But Costco has been remarkably resilient in their membership growth over the years. The other thing that's really amazing with Costco, and I recommend if anyone's interested, you, you look this up on YouTube, look up the Costco walkthrough in, I think it's in Shanghai. Don't hold me to that either, but it literally, you could be in your local local city in America and you think you're in the same place with slight differential, with slight difference in the products. But this idea of what they have, it works. You can put it anywhere and the same thing starts happening. That is so cool to me because I know how hard that is. And so they've, they've got something that's really special in that regard. One other thing I, I found, and this is part of the research process I went through, you know, beyond all the 10Ks and, and the annual reports, it's I wanted to understand who are the people running this business? You know, yeah, you mentioned Charlie Munger. Charlie is on the board of directors there. And, I, and I'll get to his influence on me on this investment in a second. But the there was an interview with their CFO. I think it was from 2014. The C, same CFO is there now. And they asked him why they raised wages for their, um, you know, their people in the stores. You know, there wasn't really a need for this. Actually, that wasn't the trend at the time. And he, and he, his answer was one of the coolest things he's I've ever heard someone say in response to something like that. He goes, "It was the right thing to do." Like full stop. Nothing else to say. And that tells you a lot. This is not a phony baloney. Their their commitment to not just the customers but to the people working there. It's not just marketing. It's the real deal. And I think when you look at someone like Charlie Munger and you really get to understand him beyond the, you know, the headlines that Robin Hood generates when they're trying to, you know, position Warren and Charlie as the old guards trying to stop people from making money and all this nonsense, you know, 
he likes the real deal. And, and again, someone from his generation who appreciates a good deal, period. Um, Charlie's talked about the table that they have their board meetings on. I think he said it costs like $800. He's like, compare that to the, I forget what company he referenced, but everything they do, their culture is all about just keeping it lean and just delivering as much value as possible to the people that are interacting with it. Now, uh, going back to Charlie and why I invest in Costco, I'm not going to sit here and say that I figured all that out in 2019. I was largely, I knew about Costco. I was a Costco or my parents were Costco members as a kid. I remember when they opened it up in my hometown, it was like this cool experience where my dad was really pumped. You know, some of the deals on like, my dad loved deals. So it's, it was like a a perfect place for him. And uh, you know, one of the, one of the big, I guess, like uh, it was an article in 2019 with, it was an interview with Jason Zweig from the wall street journal. And he said, you know, what are the best investments in America right now? I think or he might not even ask for America. And Charlie said, well, outside of China, Costco. And that, that was like, Ooh, at the time, you know, Charlie was really, you know, like I said earlier, his, his advice was really adding up. And I, I didn't jump into invest on that alone. And I would never recommend someone did that. Um, but it definitely got me more excited to learn more. And as I got to learn more about Charlie Munger, I really understood why he is such a fanatic about Costco. It is, it is Charlie Munger personified um, in a business. And um, it doesn't mean that I think that that Costco investment will beat the market by a lot over the long term. But I mentioned, and this is a big part of my investment approach, You know, my goal over the next 30 years is I want to beat the market by one percentage point. Now, that's going to be really hard to do, right? Like the data shows that over a 30-year period, most of us will lag the market by 3.5 percentage points. So if I can hug close to the index like the S&P and then get a couple, couple wins that are a little bit better, that's really what I need to do. And when I think of it in those terms, Costco might contribute to that by a little bit. It might lag the S&P by a little bit, but it's a business that I think is is really special. And I I have a certain level of safe optimism about the future with e-commerce, what they can do there. And Charlie talks about this a lot. And I think my marketing background helps me see this. It's the power of a brand. That Costco brand, people trust it in a way that's profound. And I don't think the average investor, not because just based on what your background is, I come from a world where it's all about building strong brands. That's the essence of marketing. And so to me, it just, I don't know any other brands that really meet those criteria that's built that brand loyalty over a long period of time like Costco has. Maybe Apple, um, but Costco's in a space that's very of its own. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. You mentioned how they can replicate their business wherever they need to. And it reminds me how Jeff Bezos mentioned, you know, all these people investing are trying to figure out what's going to change five, 10, 20 years from now. Jeff Bezos flipped that on its head and he says, well, what's not going to change? Well, what's not going to change is people are going to want low prices. They're going to they're gonna want a great customer experience. And I think that definitely applies to Costco as well. What a lot of people want in the U.S., they're going to want that internationally as well. And, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for Costco, I think. But with that opportunity comes risks. And in terms of opportunity for growth, I see, I would imagine at least some sort of maturity in the U.S. market for Costco. But there's a lot of opportunity internationally. And Mm -hmm. like you mentioned, that can be applied internationally, but that means different markets, different consumer tastes, and that brings on its own set of maybe issues. And I think the other point is what you mentioned is the trend to e-commerce. And that's another area they're going to have to definitely capitalize on and adapt to. So I'm curious if you'd like to expand on either of those. I'm glad you brought up Jeff Bezos because I think that customer obsession is something I've talked a lot about with Jeff Bezos as well as the long-term orientation. I think the seven-year timeline is what he talks about. You know, Jeff Bezos actually invests in this this project that's like a 10,000-year clock. I don't know if you know about this, but it's like a real, they're re- really serious about a simple idea. Um, in terms of Costco's ability to expand and grow, I think you're absolutely right. The saturation in the United States is one that you're not going to see the most, like I would imagine anyway, that there's a maturity that's happened. When Warren Buffett bought in, and Berkshire bought into Coca-Cola, that was one of their one of their points was that there's a big opportunity globally here. And I would say with Costco, what I like about their approach to growth internationally is that they're very measured about it. I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs that I know. I know plenty of people who are, you know, in who who could potentially be in a situation like this where, you know, they've got something that's working like gangbusters and they want to grow it internationally, they might overdo it. You know, there's a really great model I like to think of. It's uh, this idea of, uh, I don't know, from Xylem in trees. If a tree grows too fast, like a redwood tree, 
that gets like bubbles in it's in like it's I'm using like quotes, quote, the quote it's tree veins and it can rot from the inside out. Costco has this, I think, a really measured approach, even how you look at how they've expanded in China. It's not like, hey, we're crushing it. Let's go out there and grow as fast as we possibly can. They're doing it in a very measured way. And I don't know how explosive that growth can be. I'm not considering it to be like the next big growth stock of the, of the uh, you know, the 2020s here. Um, but I definitely think that that's a good sign to see in management because that means that I'm looking for sustainable growth. You know, I'm looking for it in a company also too with Costco, they have pricing power. You know, they have to maintain and make sure that they give their customers the best, the best deals. But if they rate, I would imagine if they raise their membership costs at a more aggressive rate, they wouldn't lose a lot of their members. Like I don't, I think the value that people are getting for that is, is far outweighs what that cost would be. So that's another area where, you know, Warren Buffett's talking about this. You see this a lot in, in the current press because of what's going on now. It's like, you want a business with pricing power because if they can raise prices, that's a lot of businesses can't do that. Um, not to get off topic here and please bring me back. If I, if I do this, uh, it just interrupt me, but, um, uh, Chipotle was one of the first companies that came out and said they're raising their prices. Now, I don't know about you. I know, you know, I probably do once a week Chipotle, you know, I, I, I tell myself it's for the protein. Um, but you know, in reality, I'm just, just eating a very, uh, very calorie intensive meal. Um, but <laughs> I, when Chipotle raised their prices, it didn't bother me a bit. You know, I, I like noted it I'm like, okay, but I'm not going away. And think about so many businesses you have to ask yourself. And now you can actually, you know, you don't even have to ask yourself. They are raising their prices. Um, some companies are going to be fine with that. Other companies are not going to be fine with that. I'm going to jump in there and say that I recently actually switched from Chipotle to, no. <laughs> uh, to, to a local company. Um, there's a local company that's just like Chipotle. Who knows if the f- food quality is uh, higher or not. It seems pretty comparable, but my Chipotle, Chipotle bowl is like 15, 16 bucks. And this other place is 10 bucks right now, but that's, that could change really quickly. I know that. Yeah, I'm amazed that price because I'm in, you were saying before, I'm in, I'm in New York City and I always assume that the prices are just, it's like, I used to joke, New York City's like airport prices are everywhere. You know, it's <laughs> like, I'm just constantly walking through the airport. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, you must be doing double meat, maybe some guacamole on there. Yeah, double. Yep, yep. Um, I, yeah, I've been doing the, I think, I think first we need to take a second to acknowledge what you just said because I think that is a sell signal to anyone, all the day traders who are listening. Clay is switched. Okay. We need to, <laughs> everyone, short your position out. Um, that's interesting though. And that's, but that's, um, and that's always a threat. I think with a, something like a Chipotle, I mean, reading their 10 K it's been a little while, but I love the idea that they took them. They took a model of like a quick serve restaurant where you don't need waiters and waitresses, but they've, they've branded themselves in a way where you'll pay more for the ingredients because it's, you know, non-GM, all these, you know, these kind of buzzwords and not that they're making it up, but it's, you know, it's a lot of marketing and branding and perception. And that's been a really phenomenal model for them. Not, not everyone can just go and do that. I don't think Chipotle, by the way, has a, a sustainable moat in the way that some of the businesses we've talked about before do. And, and for that reason, um, because when customers, one, you, someone else can, can bring that to the table. And two, when you're basing, you know, they've mentioned their philosophy is a competitive advantage. I don't think that's a, a real competitive advantage. I think that's a lot of, a lot of marketing. Um, personally, but that's not to go off on Chipotle too much here, but that's, I'm sorry to hear that they've lost your business. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, I haven't thought a lot about Chipotle stock, but I think their, uh, biggest competitor or biggest risk is just the inflation side. There's people can always go to the grocery store and get a much cheaper meal. So it just comes down to the convenience. How much are people sure. willing to pay for that convenience? Um, but I am not going to, you know, doubt Chipotle's business model. I've, I've ate Chipotle for years and maybe just go off and on on it. But I agree that it's definitely a strong business. It's just that there are those risks, you know, being in the food industry for sure. For sure. It's, I think that's one to be interesting to do the bad business checklist against Costco, or Costco sorry, against Chipotle. Um, you know, it's again, I think, and also another reason why low cost index funds are great because, you know, there's so much nuance. I think when you're, when people are trying to pick stocks, there's so many factors you have to consider. And even when you get everything right, Outside factors can happen that no one saw coming. You know, I don't pay attention to charts. I don't look because it's just, it doesn't tell me anything about the future. And you have to do so much real critical thinking. And even when your thinking is just rock solid, you know, you can get hit with a torpedo or something crazy can happen internally that, you know, again, nothing, no one ever saw it happening. It doesn't have to be a black swan event or some extreme. It's just, it's very difficult to run a business that keeps on growing year after year after year for decade, decade, decade. I mean, it's, it's a tough, it's so competitive. It's hard. And, it's even harder to try to pick who's going to do it. Uh, Jeff Bezos has said that. You know, just a quick uh, a quick note on Jeff Bezos. A lot of people don't realize this. 
Jeff Bezos was one of the only people in attendance at the Sun Valley Conference in 1999, where Warren Buffett gave this kind of warning of what's to come. It's almost it's I read it to my audience because it was it felt like we were going through that now. It mm-hmm. reminded me of the time period, not that I'm calling mm-hmm. tops or bottoms or anything like that. But um, Jeff Bezos was quoted in, in the Fortune article that was later written up about it. And he said it was about investing in innovation and, you know, him having a hedge fund background. He really gravitated towards what Warren Buffett was saying, and he applied it. He told his team about it. You know, Amazon's still here today. Another example of when you listen to what Warren Buffett, if you take Warren Buffett seriously, it doesn't usually work poorly for you. Um, and I think with Jeff Bezos is another just uh, if you're reading the shareholder letters that he's written over the years, um, I don't put them on the same level as Warren Buffett's, but they're all they're a source of knowledge for sure. Um, I know I enjoy reading them a lot he espouses a lot of the Warren Buffett ideals um, that I think are, it's interesting to hear his, his focus on free cash flow per share, uh, for example. And also his, he did something that, again, I'm, I'm going to show you kind of like how my brain's connecting dots here. Phil Fisher is someone that influenced Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger respectively. Um, and the philosophy of both is, was influenced by Phil Fisher as well as Ben Graham, of course, but Phil Fisher, I feel like is sort of the lesser known uh, of the two. And, and that just, it is what it is, but Phil Fisher would talk about your shareholder letters, an opportunity for you to really kind of like talk to who you want to own your shares in the first place. Uh, when Warren Buffett, if you read you know, any of his annual letters, you know, he's talking to people that are going to be long term. They're like it's like family to him. Mm-hmm. You know, he's talked about writing it in the idea that he's writing it to his sisters, um, you know, wanting to tell them everything they need to know without getting like so in the weeds where it's not productive. But he considers, I mean, it really hurt him in the late nineties when people were starting to doubt him. It wasn't so much his ego as like, he really cared about doing right by the people that invested along their hard earned savings alongside him. And I think people now he has, a, his image is so distorted by this new wave of just like pumping. And I, I'm not trying to get on my high horse about this, but I, I realized from reading all the classics during COVID, it was like most people, I don't think they've ever read a book about Warren Buffett. Like Warren Buffett is not motivated to, oh, he wants to keep things a certain way. So it's, he's in control. No, he's interested in making as much money as possible. He's been interested in that since he was a little boy. He wanted to have the most money in the whole world. Like that's not a secret, but he really cares about doing right by the people that are, are in it with him. And so when I think about, you know, taking Jeff Bezos and Bezos's letters, speaking to that long-term shareholder, You know, if you invested in Amazon and you, you know, you were qualified as like a shareholder by his letter, he's, what was the first, well, maybe the first or second headline was it's all about the long term. One, that sounds like Warren Buffett. And two, he's doing that thing that Warren Buffett did and was likely influenced in some regard by Phil Fisher and saying, talking to the shareholders you want. Um, And so if you were willing to stick with Amazon, not to say it was going to work out because anything can happen, but, you know, you had to ride through some, some big investments in the short term. Uh, with a long-term mindset. And I think that's just a really interesting way to learn more about the management uh, and for the management to, to seek out the types of shareholders that will allow them to grow in the way that's going to create fortunes, not you know temporary, you know, have a nice, have a nice year of uh, returns. Um, I think there's a huge difference there. And um, you see that with those two examples. Um, I almost had yeah. this epiphany moment right there when you were talking. I was reading uh, William Green's book, Richer, Wiser, Happier, and he was talking about Nick sleep and in his book and Nick, he made his, uh, he made his investors sign this document saying this fund is not intended for short-term investors. You should be willing to, you know, park your money here for at least five years. And then I think through some of Nick sleep's favorite stocks, it's many of the ones we've already mentioned, Amazon, Costco, Berkshire, you know, he, uh, he had Amazon, he got signed off from his investors to invest over 20% in that company. So it's just really interesting how things kind of came full circle there. And before we get too far off track, I wanted to really ask you about the valuation of Costco. The sentiment I see from people is that, yes, it is a really, really good business. But one of Buffett's principles is not only to invest in great businesses, but also invest at a good or a fair price. So I'm curious to get your thoughts around the valuation or how you're valuing Costco and saying today's price um, is somewhere near fair value. Yeah, I think first and foremost, I wouldn't recommend anyone, I I wouldn't recommend anyone buy Costco or any stock for that matter. Um, I think for me, I bought Costco in 2019. and I knew at the time, based on my, you know, just rough calculations that I was not getting something that was, you know, I was going to make a fortune on, uh, but it was something that I felt like would have the chance of outdoing the S&P by a little bit. 
at in the best case scenario, in the worst case scenario, it would under it, it's a little bit below it. Um, but I was willing to kind of take that take that go of it. Now I felt a lot smarter for my efforts in the in the subsequent years because Costco had a nice run as a, as many companies have had, and and what was a crazy bull market. Um, I think with the way, yes, I do see people saying that. What people need to remember, I think, and they, they might not consider, is that one. I, I don't believe. Well, I know Berkshire doesn't own any Costco. Uh, Warren Buffett has not ever really gone on a, on a limb for Costco before. Uh, it's very much a Charlie Munger stock. Uh, Charlie Munger. They, I mean, Warren Buffett has made fun of Charlie at the meetings for his like just total, absolute uh, uh, love for Costco. Um, you know, it goes beyond love. It's like a. It's it, he he talks about it like he talks about like the greatest thing ever. Um, so I think people need to keep that in mind. And if yeah, if you, if you were to look at just on a very high level right now, and I don't have, I've not looked at the numbers that recently. Um, it imagine most of everything's priced in and it, but you know what that brings up a point that I think is missed a lot by um, it, it, especially new investors. I wish I knew this when I started, when you're looking at what, let's say the Berkshire portfolio is doing or Warren Buffett's doing, or, you know, uh, even Charlie um, they people, I don't fully, I think if you put up a list of all, like every hedge fund that exists, every, every, any sort of ETF even, and you put Berkshire and how much capital they have invested and to invest, it, the numbers are so big. They're so much bigger than what like some of these funds do. And not that the funds are small by any stretch, but the amount of capital really limits what they can invest in. And I found something interesting during this whole kind of like Bitcoin run up that happened in the last couple of years. A lot of the bit, I try to read everything, right? I try to read the stuff I don't agree with. I want to know what everyone's talking about and, and see if, again, if I, there might have some, they might've thought of something I didn't, but there was a lot of Warren Buffett was sort of used in a way that was disingenuous where they'd say, you know, look at, you know, Warren Buffett could have just bought this or, you know, what if he just bought zoom? It's like, he's, they're not able to make investments like that because their capital base. And when people were saying that, look at Berkshire's lag, the S and P, you know, it's, it's whatever the last, I think now it's actually a little bit above the S and P over a longer period, but you know, they've been both Warren and Charlie for, we're talking about decades now have said, do not expect us to, to continue compounding at these numbers. And so then that is again, the honesty factor there and also managing expectations. But what's, what's it mean to have your, you know, your capital base is so large, it limits what you can invest in. Why I think something like the Apple investment was so incredible, you know, looking back at it, everyone in their, in their brother-in-law has looked through that stock. You know, it's not a, there's no secret to it. It's, it's not low analyst coverage. Everyone knows about it. Everyone at the time. And, and, uh, and when they make those investments now, they have to make such a big investment that it's, it's, it is, I mean, they're not risky by definition we were saying earlier, but it's a lot of capital to put up into one investment. And most people don't fully, I, I think, size it appropriately to what other funds are investing at what level, you know, just the, the kind of the gut, the gumption or the guts to say, we're going to buy 7% of Apple, one of the biggest companies in the world. The other thing people don't factor in is this, and this helps. It's a good example. If you're the people playing the stock game. And I learned a lot of the, about this from Michael Maubausen, who I learned from the Warren Buffett book, or learned of from that book, and then kind of went down that pathway. The expectations that the market has for the stock. When Warren Buffett bought Apple in 2016, I say Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger was part of that process. In 2016, the expectations of Apple were very bad. Fortune Magazine called it a risky stock. And at the time, Carl Icahn, who was one of, if not the largest shareholder, had just dumped all his shares. He owned at least 1%. He was, he was worried about the growth in China. He said, this is great, but I got to get out of this. So they did not, people now look back, the same people who are saying, you know, Warren Buffett missed the boat with, you know, Bitcoin or Zoom or whatever. At the time, people weren't, it wasn't an easy pick. And I think that's somewhat, so interesting because they have the disadvantage of their size. They can't just make investments in anything because they have to literally buy the whole company. Because, um, you know, 7% of Apple would buy you, I don't know how many Zooms you could buy with that. Um but then it, it's not as if they're just waltzing into whatever is popular. It just looks that way in reverse. Um, and I think that's something when you talk about why is it better to go indexing versus individual stock picking, I always say this. It's not because people aren't capable of doing it, but they don't fully appreciate like the ice in the veins and real knowledge that's going into these decisions. That to me is, is really impressive. And I admire it because not just for the reasons I stated, but typically as people get older, their minds, you get rigid right? Your mind gets a little bit rigid. And I look at the Apple bet, you know, yeah, they can say, oh, it was just, a, it was a consumer company, blah, blah, blah. But you still had to learn some new things and apply, bring everything you already knew to the table. The BYD bet back in, what was that? 2008, I think, you know, Warren Buffett was, yeah. it was in his eighties buying into a EV and they said, oh, he's a dinosaur. That's so far from China. the truth. 
anyway, I could go off on this all day, but yeah. I think I, that's why I really appreciate your podcast and what your guys' network does because it, it brings light to the reality of, of these individuals because they're now used as sort of like us first. They're used as almost like mascots for people to sell alternative investment philosophies or, you know, frankly, a lot of a lot of nonsense and say, well, these guys don't want you to be rich. Don't listen. Look what they're doing. You know, over here, they'll bring up the new bank investment. Mm-hmm. You know, the new bank investment in the Berkshire portfolio, I don't, it was probably Todd and Ted. Again, I don't know them personally. Mm-hmm. I don't mean to sound so casual, but that was Todd and Ted. It's a teeny, teeny, teeny fraction. And you'll see people, these posts on Instagram, you know, do what they do, what they uh, do, not what they say, you know, and yep. I'll get all, I get so much commentary, but coming back my way to my accounts, you know, cause it's the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin pumpers hate Charlie Munger quotes on Instagram. Um, they're, you know, that, so I get a lot of that stuff, but uh, anyway. You mentioned you know, Warren kind of bugging Charlie about being obsessed with Costco. Mm. I'm curious if you could expand on maybe some of the differences between Warren and Charlie's investment styles and maybe where your mindset and thought process maybe falls more towards. I'm going to assume Charlie's. Yeah. So and I, I think I've said before, Charlie Munger's investment approach is to me, it's the most rational, but the hardest to imitate. Um, Charlie Munger, when Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger were, you know, first getting to really know each other, there was a lot of people that were trying to, what they use this expression, coattailing, who were coattailing Warren Buffett. I mean, Warren Buffett was almost, you know, not universally known, but universally known as like this young guy, he's the stock guy, you got to learn from him. And so there was a lot of smart people that were trying to learn from him and kind of like start up their own little, their own little shops. Charlie was different in a few different ways. One is that he, you know, he didn't have any regard for the convention. He was not coming that from an investment. He was a lawyer before. Um, he was interested in making as much money as he could. You know, he he had a lot of ambition, a lot of and a lot of need. He had a lot of children. Um, very intelligent person. Just and was uh, on his path that way. His thing early on was he he realized fairly soon into his process, and this is when he started challenging uh, on the Ben Graham some of the Ben Graham concepts of you know what is the best business. He would ask people, "What's the the best business you've ever heard of?" Because, you know, to him, there was an example, I think it was in the book, The Snowball, great book about Warren Buffett, if anyone out there has not read it, um, of a construction company that, you know, made a lot of, make a lot of money, but then you had to replace the cranes and, and the, you know, the bulldozers every year. So you have to pour that money back in. So you never really, as a shareholder, you're never really getting anything from it. It's just kind of a headache. And so his other look at the cigar butt approach is saying, yeah, this is great. And if people always talk about it doesn't scale, but it's also, you're buying a lot of businesses that give you headaches. It's not an enjoyable. Charlie Munger is like minim. He's like a minimizing effort investor. Like he puts in the work to know the business. You know, the best businesses are the ones you buy, and, and it works out great. Now that is something that sounds really easy to do, but Charlie Munger has been described as a. Uh, you talk about a volatility, a master bump ignorer. Mm-hmm. You know, he, Charlie Munger when people would this Alibaba situation, and, and I will. I don't want to go around the question. I want to make sure I come back to it. But this Alibaba investment that Charlie Munger has made a lot of headlines for. You know, people were coming at me saying, see, you're a hero, you know, look, big mistake here. I'm like, you don't understand. He doesn't care. Like, it's all about the long term. And at this point, it's not he doesn't plan to see the investment play out. You know, it's literally like, yeah, I don't care if I'm wrong in the one year, two year, three year, five year. And and that's something that's very difficult to be like. Now, another reason the differential approach, and I, I think I lean towards Charlie's approach, but I don't I've avoided trying to imitate it mm-hmm. is he is very concentrated, right? And he will bet against the consensus at times that are very difficult to do that. Um, A story that I recently shared on our podcast that I didn't know about, it was like some, some, I was digging through the wall street journal archives uh, during when all the banks, you know, were going belly up back in, what was that? 2008. Um, That daily journal portfolio, Charlie loaded up on, um, took the cash reserves and loaded up on all the bank stocks at a time when everyone was running from them. And that could have easily gone wrong. It doesn't mean just because, oh, he's smart. It's not like he's not a, he can't see the future, but, you know, using his models, using what he knows about reality says, you know, in all likelihood, these companies are not going to go belly up. That's not going to happen. And I think they're dirt cheap right now. And I'm not, I'm not saying I know exactly what he was thinking, but he loaded up. And the reason they have all this extra money in that portfolio to buy things like Alibaba was because of that decision. I mean, it was a huge win. And uh, Warren's alluded to it at different Berkshire meetings before uh, and it totally slipped behind me. Um, and that is an approach where his own portfolio, he said that 90% of the, the Munger fortune has come from three things, the Berkshire shares, uh, Costco, and then the investment he made with Li Lu um, and through Li Lu's uh, fund in China. That is, again, not normal for most people. It's not what's, it's not what's taught. 
Um, it's also something that Warren Buffett hasn't had the full luxury to do, being that he's the steward of Berkshire Hathaway. Um, it would not be realistic for him to operate in that manner. You know, people often ask me, why is Warren Buffett worth so much more money than Charlie Munger? And it's, you know, it's a kind of a silly question in the first place because it's like, you know, but the simple explanation would be, well, for one, Charlie Munger doesn't own nearly as much Berkshire as you might think by being vice chairman, but it's it's a enough to it can make you a fortune. Um, that's one reason. But also, you know, because of Warren Buffett's the situation with Berkshire and all and all the I think most people don't even realize how many businesses they own outside of the stock portfolio. They think it's a hedge fund. Like I'm convinced if you asked a lot of people on TV, like, do you realize like Geico's that's Berkshire, right? They're what? You know, and that and that's like the most obvious example of a business they own all of. But that's what's amazing. Like they have so like they have most train tracks. Or was it uh, BNSF? I mean, it's amazing yeah. the business, the the uh, the portfolio they have. But when you're running a company like Berkshire, you have to do that. You can't just buy three things. Or maybe you could, but I think that's a very it'd be kind of the you know mm-hmm. it'd be a little weird. But Warren has said you know we just need to be make a good decision every two years or so. Mm-hmm. Um, so but I think when you're an individual like Charlie Munger, who's totally independent, who's totally just. Uh, he's eccentric. He's going to do things his way. He can have a portfolio like what I described. Yeah. I think uh, one of my favorite Charlie Munger quotes is the first rule of compounding, never interrupt it unnecessarily. I think I might've learned some of that from Warren because he started investing at what the age of like 12 or so, maybe yes, earlier yes. than that. 11 so, or something. Yeah. So Warren, uh, you know, started the compounding process so much earlier relative to Charlie who, you know, previously was a lawyer. Hundred percent, and I love that quote too because it—it's a quote that the first time I read it, I thought I understood it, and then over time, I, I got to really appreciate. You know, one of the other contributing factors um, of the Charlie Munger approach is—is is the uh, unwillingness to sell even when you have something that's worked out great. I know there was a little bit of a joke about you know I think Warren sold a little bit of the Apple stock back a couple of years ago. Don't hold me to that timeline, but. You know, Charlie was like, I, I told him not to. Um, and one of the reasons is, and this is something I think is, it's very counterintuitive to wrap your head around in the book that we were just talking about before that we started uh, uh, doing the show here today, uh, the Warren Buffett portfolio. I learned about this. Con- I think Robert Hagstrom, the author, really explained this concept well. You know, when you take your 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 gains and you pay your taxes, you know, that tax is, is in a way interrupting the compounding process. The longer you can let that unrealized gain continue over year after year, he describes it as it allows you to compound more forcefully. Now, it might not, the company might not be growing maybe at the same rate that it was, but oftentimes, and, and again, people can pull out, you know, a compound interest calculator and figure it out for themselves. There's always going to be some nuance to it, but there's real advantage in just not getting in the way of it. And I think that's a bigger lesson for us as investors. Our, even with the best intentions, our tendency is to mess it up, right? I, I tell people during like a bear market, you know, I'm, not claiming to be a financial advisor, but the advice I'm applying for myself is like, just don't do anything. Like as long as you own, Jack Bogle would say, you know, if you if you bought right, you can sit tight. So as long as, you know, you're not sitting on a bunch of speculative nonsense and, you know, you paid too much for it and, you know, you just were careless about it. There's not much you can do right now to help yourself. Like trying to find, oh, I'm going to time this or I think oil's going here, so I'm going to do this. It's very fun to do that. And I totally get the appeal. But generally speaking, I think if we looked at everyone's track record over a long period of time, the times when we think we know something and we're, oh, I'm going to get in here and just uh, finagle around with it, we ruin it. And it reminds me of a model, uh, uh, was it latrogenics? I, mean, I, mean, I think I rarely say the word out loud. Um, it's the idea of, of like when you have a, you know, back in the day, someone might have had some sort of disease that needed curing and they would do like they drain their blood or like the things that we had to do to get to modern medicine. And just by having, just by intervening, we actually do more harm than good. And I re- I'm reminded of that a lot. I think that intervention tendency that we have, while it's our best intention, not only oftentimes does it not work, but it, it in fact interrupts the compounding process. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's just my, how I've, my appreciation for that quote has, has gotten deeper. Well, Chris, I really appreciate you coming onto the show. This is a really fun conversation. Went, went by really quickly, it felt like. It did, yeah. Before we close out the episode, I wanted to give you a handoff to tell the audience what else you're working on, what you got going on Instagram, YouTube, and all these other platforms and stuff you're doing. So, no, totally. Well, you know, as I said, I'm an individual investor. You know, my, I have a business here in New York City that I, I often don't talk too much about on, on, the investing side of things. And I'll keep it that way to, you know, again, my incentives are all, are all positive here. Um, you know, for myself, I, I wanted to uncover everything that was true about investing and, and just be able to understand it the best way I possibly could. Cause I think it's important. I think it's important for anyone, no matter what level you're at 
or what the, the level you are currently, um, you know, would see yourself at, you know, to know this stuff inside and out. And it's to remember that we're all capable of knowing it and even knowing it better. Um, in terms of what I'm working on, you know, I think you found me through some of the the Instagram pages that I've uh, unintentionally have become sort of like a popular meme accounts. The Charlie Munger quotes is one that I'm using every day. Um, it's helped me retain a lot of the great wisdom of Charlie Munger. Uh, considering how how unfamous Charlie Munger really is, the fact that we have 102,000 followers now, all real followers, all like highly engaged, is, is I'm very very pleased to have added something back to that. Uh, you know, help more people discover Charlie. Um, Warren Buffett videos is another page on IG, but I'd say if you enjoy the podcast and again, you guys, I, you guys are the leader in this space. I just, I've got a, a small, but growing uh, a podcast called the CMQ investing podcast. It's mostly 99 episodes of me talking about these different topics. I think we'll start doing interviews in, in after we pass episode 100, but um, the podcast has been great. And then YouTube has been a channel where I, I experiment a lot. And I try, I bring my sense of humor into it and, and just trying to see, you know, for me, and this is me speaking as a bit of like, what is, you know, what do I want to give back and try to, you know, do that maybe hasn't been done is try to take some of these big ideas that we've discussed on this, on the show. And again, I appreciate you so much for having me um, and take some of these ideas and make them more readily, um, uh, not just available, but make them more appealing and maybe even entertaining mm -hmm. for a new audience, because I think they are kind of, I, I don't want to sound corny, but kind of life-changing ideas that if you can really internalize them and apply them, they can just make your life work better. Um, it doesn't, not even about, you know, oh, you'll make more money. It's just things will work in, in a bit uh, more efficiently for you. Mm -hmm. At least that's been my experience. And so um, I think a lot of times the world of finance is very intimidating um, you know, I used to think that everyone who worked on wall street, and I have a lot of friends who work on wall street, but I thought everyone was like Albert Einstein. You know, I would never have thought, oh, I can actually like contribute something here or say something that someone could learn from. Um, but once you get past and really, you know, dig in and, and I mentioned reading 10 Ks, um, and, and reading the wisdom of investors like Warren or Charlie, or listening to a podcast like yours, um, you know, you can find things that you're interested in and go deeper in it and just follow your curiosity. I think you'd be amazed uh, at what can come from that. So CMQ is and CMQ investing is my, my way to try to contribute to that. Um, so just to do the plugs, I guess the CMQ investing is a podcast. It's on Apple and Spotify. There's CMQ investing on YouTube. If you want to see me make a fool of myself occasionally and probably borderline get canceled, um, that's where you can check that out. Um, and of course, the Charlie Munger quotes page is an Instagram page that I'm uh, very proud of and have put a lot of time into just spreading things that have helped me from Charlie. So um, I'll leave it there. And Chris Franco on Twitter, Franco with a C, if you're looking to uh, for some tweets. Well, some of us mortals have 24 hours in a day, but I meet some people. <laughs> sometimes I meet people like you where it feels like you have 72 or maybe even more hours in a day to work on all these things. <laughs> sure, no, it's I, I need to slow down. I, I've been trying to take a little bit of a break on the uh, the last couple of days. I've actually been a little bit more like the end of the month. I'm like, I need to enjoy the summer a little bit. So uh, I appreciate you at least acknowledging that. I, I'm glad it's not going unnoticed. And I really do appreciate you reaching out and including me. Um, you know, this is kind of a surreal moment to be on uh, on your program. So um, it's, it's also just great to meet you and I appreciate what you guys do in spreading a lot of the, these important ideas, um, you know, through your platform. Yeah, definitely. Well-deserved Chris. I'm happy to have you on and we'll probably have you back in the future again as well. So thanks again. Would love to do it. Well, thanks so much for having me, Clay. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell. So you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.